are you having for? Do you still want to work in humanitarian aid? Yes, of course. A lot of lives will say we have seen the faces of the children screaming for the fires. I wish to have uh, special powers to help them. Welcome, dear listeners, to our podcast on humanitarian work and the need to help. Produced as part of the Comparative Humanitarianism Seminar at the Geneva Graduate Institute. We are Seraina, Sol, Nicole, and Valentina, and we'll be hosting you today. With this podcast, we want to put ourselves in the shoes of humanitarian workers. What is it that motivates them? Why do they choose to work in this field, even though it can be risky? How do they feel? And is it really worth it in the end? We will share with you the story of a young doctor who is passionate about helping other people. We will hear excerpts from the interview and discuss them together as we go along. Jason Arasso is a medical doctor and surgeon from Honduras. He worked with the Ministry of Health in the context of the COVID-19 emergency response and as a national consultant to the United Nations Population Fund. He also served as a Red Cross volunteer for eight years and participated in different citizen-led humanitarian initiatives. During 2020, Honduras was hit by the ETA and Utah hurricanes, after which Jason organized with the local community different relief efforts while also participating in rescues with the Red Cross. Jason explains what being a humanitarian practitioner means to him. He started out as a doctor, but then he realized that hospitals can be a barrier for some people. This barrier keeps many people from getting the help they need. It prevents him from reaching communities and changing people's lives, which is why he chose a medical career in the first place. His volunteer and community service work reaffirmed his vocation, since he finds that humanitarian aid is a way to have a real and meaningful impact on people's lives. For us, when we are doctors and we are working in a hospital, we're helping people to come in an emergency room. But that people, they have the capability to go to the hospital and look for help. But what is with in Latin America country, 70% of the population live in poverty. And a lot of people don't have the capability to go to the hospital only because they don't have the money to pay the public transportation or they don't have a near a hospital or a near uh, primary, primary care service. So with humanitarian context, we, ha- we make decisions or we create projects, or we do action to help the all those people that they are in really vulnerability and they are really suffer. And they are, and it's not other organization, or it's not, or the government doesn't have the, the power or the resources to help them. It seems like the feeling of wanting to help people in need is stronger than anything else for Jason. And from my experience, I believe that many people get involved in humanitarianism because they have this strong feeling of wanting to help others. I mean, for some of them, it could be about a moral obligation, and for others, it may be linked to their wish to reduce suffering. But to be honest, I mean, from my point of view, it's not all about altruism. For what I have seen these years working in humanitarian aid, many people also become humanitarian workers because that makes them feel good about themselves. Oh, actually, this makes me think of a book called The Need to Help, written by Lisa Malki. She poses a challenge to this pure image of the selfless humanitarian hero and argues that there exists different kinds of motivation. In her book, she looked at humanitarian workers in the Finnish Red Cross, and she found that many workers have this need of being part of something significant, something much larger than themselves. So eventually there is some kind of personal reward in doing humanitarian work. Right, Sol? Yes, exactly, Valentina. There are not only diverse motivations, but also different forms to help. And now we are going to listen to Jason telling us how he experienced help in different ways as a humanitarian worker. So we asked Jason what was the most meaningful experience for him. Yes, so I will say that that experience that had more and more 
impact in my life actually in, in my future career will help in the Huracan Eta and Iota, the most severe natural disaster that I had that hit Honduras in more than 20 years. That was in November 23 when two hurricanes impact the north area of Honduras. At that time, I was working with United Nations as a consultant, but uh, my project was stopped and because for the disaster, obviously. So I returned to use my Red Cross uniform because we needed to do something for the people. What, but what happened? Like you were working as a consultant, but when the year I can came, you decided to go again, go back to the Red Cross? Yes, the thing is like uh, working in the United Nations, more in Honduras, we only work uh, in a context for development. We, we don't work in humanitarian action or in emergency context. Just other organizations work in, in, in emergency context. And for that reason, actually, United Nations has a really strict uh, security system. So actually, they didn't allow me to participate directly. But uh, they stopped the project. I decided to go with Red Cross, under Red Cross, and work with them and with my community as well. So the Red Cross had a more quick response in this particular situation? Yes. When it's a uh, disaster, so it's, for example, a flood, only a few organizations have an immediate response. For example, in my country, it's Honduras Red Cross and a local government. But the problem actually was that even though I was working for Red Cross, we didn't have all the resources to work. And actually, it's more the community who has a really impact in the beginning of the emergency because, for example, uh, Honduras Red Cross didn't have boots, didn't have all the personnel to act. And how did the local people, like, how did the community organize in these moments? Well, as we saw that the government and actually other organizations wasn't able to act in the first days or in the few hours of the disaster, the local community, for example, I will tell you one of my experience. I was doing rescues and I fell a bus with 60 people and I needed to bring them to a shelter that the government said me that was a shelter, so all supposed to be a shelter. But when I arrived, it was closed and nobody was there. And I was with 16 people that they didn't eat anything in around four days. And they was really dehydrated, for example, and they didn't have anything with them. So I called friends, for example, and the local community in less than 30 minutes opened the shelter, bring them food, bring them uh, clothes, and start to help them. Because actually, was the 40% of the territory of Honduras was affected. So the government and all the organization wasn't able to act in the first days of response. And we have a really nice motto, and we are always remembering that only people save the people. Why we have the motto? Because the government and other organization wasn't able to act in the first moments. Obviously, later, the organization could, could uh, start to help, but not in the first days. Now, Jason explains well how, in his experience, help for people in need is organized after a natural disaster, like how the roles that the community, the organizations, and the government play are very different, but how they're all important. Uh, he pointed out that the community efforts are the first ones to spring into action, and these community or grassroots activities are often not connected to international organizations, and instead are locally set up. This also means that they do not rely on large donors and they're not as professional and bureaucratic as big organizations. But what do you think, Serena? You make a good point there, uh, Nicole. We can see this type of humanitarian aid after natural disasters like earthquakes and floods or the hurricanes in Honduras. And of course, these activities are often temporary until the crisis is over. And I think they're also more dynamic because new people join or new ideas how to help come up. And I personally have never worked in the humanitarian field, but I can imagine that the organization of the help is very spontaneous. Like after seeing others in need, people simply start to help out. And Jason remembers a phrase they used to say in times of extreme need, only the people save the people. And I think this motto shows a very human and local approach to humanitarian aid. 
Yeah, exactly. And it's different from the humanitarian action of international organizations like the ICRC or Doctors Without Borders, that they're definitely more structured and organized. Uh, but also, Jason mentioned that all forms of humanitarian aid are important, uh, but they just simply work at different times. So there we can see the importance of not only the big organizations, but the community work that Jason described. There's where we can question the binary of the humanitarian and victim. Victims themselves can be involved in humanitarian work, and they're not always just recipients of aid. This seems obvious since the motivation to help others can be felt by anyone, even those affected by disasters themselves. Yeah. Like in other words, we can say that in one moment, one is a victim and in the next, a humanitarian. And this also changes the relationship between the humanitarian and the recipient. The person that receives help is not a distant other who is suffering, but someone from one's own community, like a neighbor, a friend or a family member. In that sense, victims are not passive recipients and they also don't lack agency. And this also reminds me of Pia Klemp's tech talk that uh, really inspired me. She's a captain from Sea-Watch and rescues refugees on the Mediterranean Sea. And she said that her organization operates at eye level. This means that she doesn't see herself as a humanitarian, but just as a person standing in solidarity with others. Yeah, um, from what we heard from Jason, it seems like he also sees people at an eye level. And he this is exactly the reason why for him it doesn't matter if he works in a big organization or just with the community, because the motivation and willingness to help, it's what it counts. But uh, Serena, I wonder, do all humanitarian workers see others at an eye level? That's a good question, Nicole. But Jason also knows from experience that anyone trying to help will face some challenges. So now we will listen to him as he tells us about some of the difficulties he had to deal with as a humanitarian worker. Well, I would say that is I felt frustrated sometimes because I wanted to do more at one time and or in the beginning, but I couldn't because, for example, I didn't have the resources. Even though I'm saying when I was working with 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 Red Cross, because even though we have the the people to wanted to work in that moment, we didn't have the whole the resources to work with that. And I feel I felt actually really frustrated as well how the government was incapable to act in this crisis. And I felt as well a little bit. Um, annoyed for how the organization as United Nations, for example, they had a really delayed response to these kind of disasters. But I understand as well that, for example, they need to do uh, a, 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 lo a really long process to, to act in a disaster, but the people need help. So I will say that I feel like in a controversial way that what I can do with all my knowledge or what I can do to help all the people. And what were like the main challenges you faced during this hard time? The mental process that I that, that I have experienced and I think was the most shocking ones that I, I had ever experienced because when I was on field, I wasn't able or I feel that I wasn't able to help All, all the people at the same time and I feel really frustrated because for example when when I took a boot or when uh when we have in, in an helicopter we can we started to rescue only childs women and old people and we let back uh, they, we separate families practically we have seen the faces of the children screaming for the fires we have seen for example people that they only give us their children to save them first because when we are in, in that moment we we need to act in in all in, in priori side but actually at this moment i wish to have uh, special powers for example to help them in in the same time but i couldn't of course of course Mark. Must, might be super tough like after all what you have been through Uh, do you think that you still want to work in the humanitarian aid? Of course. With humanitarian aid, we have the opportunity to work for a community. We have the opportunity to change life for a 
community, for a department, even though make projects for a whole countries. And we are, and with our actions, we involve and help uh, such more people than only, for example, being as a doctor working in a hospital. So for that reason, I will say that I love humanitarian action and I love to help people in such a difficulties. Well, as we can see, frustration, the side of suffering, and a feeling of powerlessness has accompanied Jason during his work. And maybe his biggest challenge has been accepting the fact that he can't help everyone. But still, his motivation exceeds the difficulties, and he's completely sure that he wants to keep working in this field. But Jason is definitely not alone with these feelings. What do you think, Valentina? Yeah, I agree, Sol. I have never worked in the humanitarian field, actually, but I can imagine how hard it must be to just cope with the sense of helplessness and the fact that suffering will never end. But actually, when I listened to Jason speaking about his work, I thought that if he can at least help some people and change some lives, then that could be enough to just keep him going. At some point, Jason says, I wish I had superpowers. But the truth is that he doesn't. No one does. And the whole humanitarian sector struggles with these feelings of powerlessness. Yeah, of course. It seems like challenges are part of humanitarian aid. Well, this podcast is coming to its end and we hope we got to bring you closer to what motivates Jason and other humanitarian workers to keep going. In our discussions, we found that there can be two sides of the same coin regarding humanitarian work. On the one hand, there is the motivation to reduce suffering. On the other hand, the need to help is linked to the reward some workers feel when they get involved in humanitarian aid. Of course, this is not to generalize. Every worker has their own motivations and challenges. And in my view, what matters is the fact that they are helping others. This conversation with Jason left us with some reflections. Is it possible to think of humanitarian work without frustration and a sense of helplessness? And you, our dear listener, after getting to know about Jason's passions and challenges, would you like to be a humanitarian worker? And do you feel the need to help?